This mouse with a spinal cord injury has extraordinary improvement after receiving the investigational drug NBG291 being purported to treat multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, and even other neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. In this video, I'll explain the pathophysiologic basis of the drug, some of the early basic science and animal research, and even early clinical trials in humans. Citations below. Unlike what was believed decades ago, the nervous system System does have some capability to grow, repair, sprout new axons, form new synapses, but after an injury, a scar can form. This is a section from a spinal cord in a rat with a traumatic spinal cord injury showing extensive fibroblast cells of the connective tissue forming an impressive barrier that can prevent repair. Research has shown that within the extracellular matrix of the area of injury are these compounds called chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans. You may recognize chondroitin sulfate, the popular supplement you take when you have an orthopedic injury. And these are chains of glycosaminoglycans that have sulfur groups attached to a core protein, and they form these large continuous structures that may impair normal nervous system repair after an injury and may block the sprouting of axons or nerve fibers. This is the structure of chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans, which have a protein core surrounded by chondroitin sulfate side groups groups and they can form extensive long chains. This diagram shows an area of injury. You see a neuronal cell body and some sprouting axons. And in red are represented the chondroitin sulfate glycosaminoglycans. And they don't just form a physical barrier. They also have a chemical interaction with a transmembrane receptor on the sprouting axons called tyrosine phosphatase sigma, or PTP sigma. And this interaction actually signals the sprouting axon to stop. In other words, it inhibits neuronal growth. You may wonder why would this occur? It's thought to be important in embryonic development to prevent nerves from growing in areas where they're not supposed to be or to force nerves and axons to grow in a certain direction. And the theory behind NVG291 is there's just too much of this inhibitory signal at the site of injury preventing axonal sprouting. And it turns out these chondroitin sulfate glycosaminoglycans are everywhere. This is from a cervical rat spine spinal cord injury, the neural components are stained in green, and the glycosaminoglycans are stained with the WFA stain in red, and you can see it's very extensive, forming a net around the neurons, and so it's really blocking neuronal growth. Much of this research was done by Dr. Jerry Silver, depicted on the right, and his team. They discovered this interaction between chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans and what he calls the intracellular sigma peptide, which is the transmembrane protein tyrosine phosphatase sigma and the interaction I just showed you a moment ago and how that was inhibiting neuronal and axonal sprouting. And so Dr. Silver and other experts and investors formed the company NerveGen Pharma and it was founded very recently in 2018. It's based out of Vancouver, Canada. And they took this intracellular sigma peptide as a model and formed a synthetic compound, which is NVG291. And it's simply 35 amino acids. And here's the sequence. There's actually a different rodent version and a human version, although the difference is only one amino acid. And there are companies that you can pay to synthesize amino acids. And some brave people have actually attempted to pay for these companies to synthesize it and try it themselves. You can try this at your own risk. It's given as a subcutaneous injection probably once a day, though the exact formulation, I believe, is still being worked out. And it enters rat central nervous system within one hour of administration. The structure of NVG291 includes the business end of the molecule, which is a 25 amino acid sequence, which is homologous to PTP sigma, the protein that interacts with chondroitin sulfate glycosaminoglycans in the image I showed you earlier, and also a 10 amino acid sequence, the TAT tag, which allows this protein
protein to translocate easily through cell membranes so it can get where it needs to go. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I'm a clinical neurologist. I don't normally read a lot of spinal cord injury, basic science, and animal research, and I apologize for any inaccuracies in this presentation. But let's move on to animal studies, and we'll start with multiple sclerosis. These are slides from a study in experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, a mouse model of multiple sclerosis, where mice are exposed to lysolethacin, a myelin toxin, and then allowed to recover. On the left, we see the placebo group treated three days, and then we see 21 days after the injury. These are pathological sections from sacrificed mice, and this is a myelin stain where the myelin stains dark blue, and the NVG291 group is on the right, treated and then three days and then 21 days after the injury. You can see the placebo treated mouse has a large area of myelin loss where there's almost no injury in the mouse that's treated with the drug. Of course, that could be a cherry pick slide. So here we're looking at all the data. We're looking at lesion volume in the Y axis. The blue is vehicle or placebo. You can see the lesion size increases after injury and then shrinks down as repair naturally occurs even in the placebo group, but there's much more repair and a much smaller lesion in mice treated with the NVG291 compound. This is electron microscopy looking at a cross-section of the nerve fibers in a sacrificed mouse treated with intracellular sigma peptide or NVG291 on the bottom. Much more impressive myelination than the mouse treated with placebo on top. And it's known that chondroitin sulfate glycosaminoglycans are present in multiple sclerosis plaques in humans, so perhaps this drug could be effective for humans with multiple sclerosis, although there's no ongoing phase one or two trial in humans quite yet. So for now, we'll shift to traumatic spinal cord injury and the effects of NVG291. This is a stain of two rat spinal cords who had a traumatic spinal cord injury. The spinal cords are arranged from rostral towards the head to caudal towards the leg, and the injury is here in the middle. And this is a 5-hydroxytryptamine stain, which looks at neural tissue. And you can see in the vehicle or placebo, there's much less staining within the area of the lesion and caudal to that, whereas there's more staining in the mouse treated with intracellular sigma peptide, also known as NVG291, suggesting there was some neuronal regeneration. This slide shows the motor outcomes of mice after a spinal cord injury using the BBB scale, which is a computerized motor recovery scale thought to eliminate human bias. You can see the BB score on the y-axis. Higher score means better function better recovery. After the injury, all the mice have no function, but then they're allowed to recover. You can see the solid black line is the vehicle or placebo. They get some recovery, but then plateau. But those getting the drug, intracellular sigma peptide, NBG291, recover a little bit more. Not a huge difference, but this was a statistically significant difference. It turns out some rats don't respond at all, where others, the dashed red line, have a quite significant recovery. Recovery. So I think a realistic expectation is not total recovery of all humans with spinal cord injury, but perhaps some increased recovery in some people receiving the treatment. They also looked at bladder function urination. It turns out after a spinal cord injury, the bladder is contracting, but the sphincter muscles aren't relaxing, and so you tend to retain urine and urinate less frequently. It's actually different in a milder spinal cord injury where you actually may urinate more frequently. But anyway, with placebo, placebo, there were only about 0.5 voids or urinations per hour, but in those getting the drug, it was roughly double on average one void per hour. And that's one of the major complaints of people with spinal cord injury, and it can lead to serious urinary tract infections as well. Now, the data I showed you was for acute or subacute spinal cord injuries where the intervention came right after the injury, but could NVG291 work months or years later? Well, this was a study on chronic mouse spinal cord injury, and they did not treat the mice until three months after the injury. So you can see baseline and then time zero. This is actually a three-month difference, and then they treated the mice with either vehicle, placebo, or the drug NVG291, and there was more improvement, which was statistically significant, over many weeks. This is not the BBB score, but the forelimb locomotor 
locomotor rating scale, a different score for motor function, but the difference is just as impressive with the acutely treated mice. We don't know too much about the potential side effects of NVG291. This is a phase one trial in humans. So the drug was given to healthy humans, humans without multiple sclerosis, without spinal cord injury, and some had some injection site reactions, irritation at the site of injection. There was an increased rate of headaches, 25% in the treated group versus 15% in the placebo group, but no serious side effects, though the sample size is quite small, so we don't know about rare serious side effects. But we'll learn more fairly soon and get some real data, possibly by as early as mid-2025. This is an ongoing phase 1B trial for NVG291 in traumatic spinal cord injury, not multiple sclerosis or any other disease quite yet. They're recruiting 20 subjects with chronic spinal cord injury who've had the injury for greater than a year up to 10 years and 20 with a subacute spinal cord injury 10 to 49 days after the injury. It has to be an incomplete cervical spine injury, so not a complete injury at the level of C7 or higher, and the participant has to be able to initiate at least one step with one leg. I think they want people with some motor function so that potentially they can measure a noticeable improvement. And they recently announced September 30th, 2024, that they're near completion of recruiting the chronic spinal cord injury cohort, the 20 people. I don't know how long it is for them to recruit the people with acute or subacute spinal cord injuries. You can imagine there are many more people with chronic older injuries waiting to get into the trial. So most likely we'll have the data for chronic spinal cord injury mid 2025 or a little later and then perhaps later than that, we'll get data on subacute spinal corner injury. My opinion, it's more likely to show a benefit on people with more recent injuries, but based on animal data, it could potentially be effective in both. So I think this is really exciting research. I give a ton of credit to the basic science and animal researchers who developed this technology over many decades, most of the studies which I didn't mention in this presentation. Of course, even after the phase 1B trial is completed, it's not a randomized trial. There's no placebo group. So we won't really know if it was effective or not. There will have to be a phase two and phase three trial. So it will be quite a while until this drug is actually on the market, even if it's proven to be effective. I'd be interested to know if you had the opportunity to enter this trial, would you consider it? And what do you think about this? How optimistic are you that it could be effective? And let me know if you have ideas for other videos.